Okay, thank you very much. So I first would like to thank the organizers for the invitation and the opportunity to speak here. And I have to apologize because, I mean, this is a work in progress about a subject I kind of learned uh, quite recently. So it might be a kind of weird and hard talk to follow. I know that it's the last one, but I, I'll try to make it as fancy as possible. So. I think so. The, the whole story starts with this paper by Alexandrov, Konsevich, Roth, and Zaboronsky when they developed a kind of formalism for, to deal with uh, uh, gauge theories. And basically, they, they, they kind of constructed many gauge theories by means of what are called sigma models using the BV formalism. And all this is based on basically symplectic structures with some shift on some mapping spaces. And the whole difficulty is that these mapping spaces just have infinite dimension. So there are all kinds of problems that appear. And quite recently, so a second set of four guys, so Pontayev, Toen, Vaki, and Vedozi, they developed a formalism well suited for algebraic geometry to deal with those symplectic structural mapping spaces, avoiding any infinite dimension uh, complication. So. I will try to introduce this formalism and kind of use it. And there is another nice thing is that there is this, this uh, very huge paper of Fleury about uh, what is called fully extended T TFTs. And in a also recent paper, Katerne, Omnyev and uh, Reshetikin just said in a, probably in a remark of two lines that uh, the AKZ formalism can be extended to a fully extendable uh, field theories. So I started to, I mean, after a talk by Cateneo, I started to try to look at this and I just convinced myself that putting the first and the third paper together might be a, a good idea. So that's what I'm going to try to explain in the first part of the talk, actually two-thirds of the talk. And in the end, I will just discuss boundary con condition and maybe, uh, hopefully, uh, how this can be able to recover um, the symplectic groupoid that, that arise from the Poisson Sigma model of Schaller, Strobel, and, uh, and Ikeda. So, I cheated a little bit, so, okay. This is a kind of crash course in uh, derived algebraic geometry. So, uh, from now by a stack, I will just mean a derived Artin stack, which is a kind of I mean, it's a very complicated object, but anyway, just to give you some grasp of the, this notion, let's start with uh, affine schemes. So these are just commutative algebras, basically. Um, if you want to consider schemes by the functor of points, you'll get some functor on the category of commutative algebras with values in sets. The main point with schemes, just like with manifold, if you take just fiber products of, or quotients, you end up with just pathological space, maybe you just end up with something which is not a, a, a manifold. So to avoid, I mean, getting some two singular things, you have to kind of enlarge the category with which you work with. So first thing, if you want to, th to get things which are still smooth by just taking quotients, you have, I mean, it's a kind of well-known thing that you have to go to stacks. So usually people just use groupoids to model stacks. But the point is that if you take quotients again, you might get something that is no longer a stack. So you have to go to higher stacks. And the main object that models this are simply shell press sheaves. So now instead of taking sheaves uh, or functor, uh, functor with values in set, it will take values in simply sets. And uh, if you want to resolve the problem of taking uh, a fiber product, you have to do the same thing, but now you have to replace commutative algebra by simply shell algebras. And since I will be working in characteristic zero, you can just take negatively graded, I mean non-positively graded DG algebras. It works perfectly the same. So the main feature, again, is that it just allows to take pullback, namely fiber products and quotient, and still get something which you can think about it as being smooth. So if you don't feel comfortable with this, and I would perfectly understand, and if you know about Q-manifolds, just think about those derived art in stacks uh, or as kinds of Q-manifolds, which are both, both positively and negatively graded. So you remember in the, in the talk of Giovanni Felder, you had those kind of objects, you call them differentiable manifolds, 
I don't know, the, the, I don't remember the name exactly, but uh, DG manifold, or there are many names for those things. And uh, part of the grading was here to resolve the problem that we were looking at, at a critical locus that might be singular. So to resolve this, you have to take a consultate resolution. So this will be just the negative part of the grading. And for the positive part of the grading, it comes from the fact that we were on the, on the Jacobian algebra, we were taking invariants because there were symmetries. And by modeling out by those symmetry, you, can, you could introduce some more singularities. And the, negative, the positive part of the grading is there to just resolve this. So that's, those derived stacks are just things that allow to deal with, uh, I mean, singular spaces just as if they wouldn't be singular. Anyway, so one example of this, well, any ordinary schemes are just example of those, obviously. Uh, one, another example is that PL manifold or even homotopy types in general provide examples of derived stacks. The main point is that if you have, let's say, a compact topological space, you take its singular chains, it gives you a simplicial set, being a simplicial set, it's an example of a simplicial scheme, I mean, just a bunch of points. And being a simplicial scheme, by this yoga here, it gives you an example of a stack. So the nice thing is that any topological space gives an example of a stack, and that will be very important in the, in the rest of the talk. Um, right, so I think I can start with actu actually a symplectic structure on those objects. So from now on, X will be a stack. Um, and I will be considering uh, an object you have already seen, so this shifted uh, tangent bundle. It just, I will write it as a mapping space, so uh, let me write this. So it's a mapping space from the classifying space of just the additive group. G A to X. So just think of G A if you're used to uh, Q manifolds or super manifolds, just the odd line. Okay? And then on this, well, B G A is a group, so it acts on itself by translations. Uh, and we, we can also act by dilations. Okay, so this is just uh, R01 cross R star if you want. Um, so, okay, now let me define close to forms. It's just a convenient way to define close to forms. I mean, it's, I'm just uh, doing some kind of tautological things. Uh, these are just functions on this shifted tangent bundle um, of weight 2 for the action by dilation in the fiber of the multiplicative group and uh, which are invariants but in a homotopy way uh, under the action of BGA. So the action of BGA, if you think about it as R01, is just a differential on some complex. So being closed, just, I mean, being, this is just saying that uh, it is closed for the Durand differential, but there is. I mean, this is the best way to write the, how the Durand differential acts on, on forms uh, in the context of this derived geometry. Okay, so just being closed is the same as being homotopy invariant under the action of BGA, or R01 if you prefer. Okay, so now definition. Um, an N presymplectic Structure on X 
is a map from uh, so omega from k the ground field shifted by 2 minus n to omega 2 closed of x I'm writing so you could say it's just an element of this space here of homological degree n minus 2 so there's another an additional grading on that guy which is the homological grading which come from the one of x so we want this to be of homological degree n minus 2 I want to write it that way because later on I will just take path in a homotopy sense so then I will consider passing this mapping space here so I'll come back to this later so you just for the moment you just can view a, a pre an n presymplectic form just has a close to form of homological degree n minus 2 okay so um, again omega is set symplectic or n symplectic if uh, the underlying two form which goes from S2 of this T X shifted by minus 1 so to OX and minus 2 if it leads to a quasi-isomorphism from uh, Tx to Lx shifted by n. So we have such a map from Tx to so I, I, I'm, I'm denoting Lx the what is called the cotangent complex. So just the I mean the cotangent space if you want. Uh, so such a thing just by contraction with a vector field gives you a map from Tx to, L to the cotangent space shifted by n and then we ask that this map is a quasi-isomorphism then this is the definition of being non-degenerate if you want okay so examples of such a thing are uh, first of all if you take G a reductive algebraic group uh, then BG the classifying space of G is too symplectic the reason for that is that the tangent bundle on BG so sheaves on BG or uh, if you want vector bundle on BG are just representation of the group G it's just almost the definition of what BG is so now the tangent bundle is just the adjoint representation and on the adjoint representation you have bilinear form namely the carton killing form and this will be your symplectic form so it just comes from the fact that at a point of BG, so a point of BG will be just a, a G bundle on some space so the tangent space at a point of BG is just by definition the agent bundle of, of this principal bundle T and on, the, on this agent bundle you have uh, I mean trace of the square of the agent action which is a well defined non-degenerate form, oh sorry there's a shift here uh, Right, and that's what makes it uh, into uh, something of degree two, right? So that's the first thing. Uh, the stack perf, so it's the stack of perfect complexes, is also too symplectic. This stack is almost the same as BGLN, so it's just, it's almost the same example. And of course, I mean, actual symplectic varieties are just zero symplectic in this sense. Okay. So let me now uh, give you how those guys uh, PTVV looks uh, how they look at the AKSZ formalism so um, so they construct mapping space mm, I mean they sorry yeah just one small question about the first example about reductive groups yeah so you say you're shifting G by degree yeah 
by one, so it doesn't mean that this, this is a kind of uh, Clifford product, or because right, you ship it by degree and then you use the uh, on yeah, so the, the, the product is symmetric on G, but it will be anti-symmetric on G shifted by 1, exactly. Uh, so now I will be discussing mapping stacks uh, with n symplectic structures. So the construction is kind of, I mean, uh, physicists have been doing this for uh, uh, years, maybe decades. So let me take sigma, uh, a stack, with, uh, I mean, some compacity property, which I'm not going to just define, it will just take too much time, but I will just show you a concrete example. and some orientation. So an orientation will be just the choice of a fundamental class and for those who are used to this kind of things you just look at uh, somehow endomorphism of uh, O sigma and it should be a trace on this uh, on this guy so it, will sh it should take value in the ground field and uh, it will be a D orientation each, if it takes values in K shifted by minus D. Anyway, so it's a kind of gadget on which basically you, c you have an integration theory and integrating has degree minus D basically. That's the idea. Uh, then, uh, if X equipped with omega is an n symplectic guy, then we can do the following construction. So we just take sigma across the mapping space from sigma to x and here is where this derived geometry is very useful. There is a representability theorem of Fleury that tells you that if sigma is precisely uh, has this compact property then this guy that you can define just as a functor Mapping, you can always define mapping space as just functors and this guy is representable in some sense so it, it just this theorem of Fleury just ensures that this guy is actually a derived uh, artin stack in the sense I, I gave before so it's a perfectly nice guy you don't have to deal with infinite dimension and, 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 and this kind of things so we have the evaluation map which go to X and here we have the projection to sigma, um, uh, sorry, to the mapping space. Then I'm going to define omega tilde. So I first take the pullback of omega through the evaluation map, and then I use my integration theory. So I integrate over the fundamental class of sigma, and this gives me. Uh, an n minus d symplectic structure uh, on the mapping space uh, maps from sigma to x. So that's something that physicists have been doing for uh, and for quite some times now. Okay, so that's a very nice thing. You start from some shifted symplectic structure, and you can produce many of them just by. Uh, um, applying some mapping space construction. So let me give you uh, two examples where you will recover usual symplectic structure you know on some moduli spaces just from this construction. Um, the first construction is take sigma, um, some compact, um, let's say PL manifold for convenience. Um, okay. So then this sigma b here, uh, I, I, I constructed before, will be an example of a, a, a stack with a, a compacity property. And assume that it's oriented. And very nicely, I mean, compact oriented PL manifold gives this sigma b a structure of a, something which is compact with an orientation as a stack. And then uh, if we take the mapping space, 
of this into BG, these are just, I mean, these are just G local system on sigma, right? And this has, uh, it's 2 minus B symplectic, just because BG is 2 symplectic and assume that this guy is d-dimensional. For example, if sigma is a compact surface, I mean, you recover the fact that, uh, I mean, a uh, G-local system on a compact surface just have a natural symplectic structure that has been discussed in, in a, at least two talks today. Uh, the other very important example is when sigma is a d Calabio variety. Uh, there is a derived mapping space from sigma to BG and these are just uh, G bundles on sigma. So the condition to be uh, D Calabio is exactly uh, the translation of, of the condition of being compact and, and oh, I should say D Calabio and uh, uh, projective. Uh, Right, so this will be also 2 minus D symplectic. And we know, for example, on, on K3 surfaces, which are example of 2 Calabi of RAC, that we have uh, G bundles on, on, on the K3 surfaces. The modular space of just such things is actually symplectic. Okay. Right, so that's the first third uh, of my program. Um, now I want to turn to uh, discussing those uh, fully extended TFTs uh, and they will arrive from N-shifted uh, uh, symplectic structures. But first I want to discuss those fully extended TFT from just mapping spaces. Uh, okay. So again, let uh, x be a stack, and I'm going to define a bunch of categories, actually higher categories, uh, from x. So the first one will be just core zero x, so core for correspondences. Uh, this will be so I'm going to write something and explain it later. So the infinity zero category. Uh, of stacks, let's say y with a map to x. So uh, an infinity zero category is just the same as an infinity groupoid, which is, well, the same in quotes uh, as a simple of set, and that's just the same as topological space. So, so let, let me say a few words about this. So. Uh, a higher category is just a category in which you have objects, morphisms, then morphisms between morphisms, which I will call two morphisms, and morphisms between two morphisms, which I will call three morphisms, and so on and so forth. An infinity zero category will be just such a thing in which all morphisms are actually invertible. I should say weakly invertible. So one morphism will have an inverse up to a two morphism, and so on. So if you have something with higher morphism, which are all invertible, it's reasonable to call this an infinity groupoid, actually. Um, why can it be modeled by topological space? The idea is the following. If, if you give me a, a topological space, I can construct an infinity zero category from it, saying that objects are just points, then morphisms are going to be passed between those points, 
two morphism will be homotopy between paths and then homotopy between homotopies and so on. And you see that all morphism would be weakly invertible because if you take one path, you go one way and the other way, it gives you a loop, and this loop is obviously contractible. Okay, so it will be, uh, anybody will be invertible. Okay. No, I mean, so there, there are, I mean, there are quillian equivalences between those things. So I'm just saying that topological space are models for infinity zero categories. So just saying that the definition of an infinity groupoid is just is a can complex. That's your usual definition people take. So by saying it's the same as Simplicial said, it's not exactly true. Uh, it just means that uh, when I, when I live in simplicial set, there is a model structure in which uh, a cofibrant object will be, uh, sorry, I never, I always mix fibrant and cofibrant object, will be can complexes. So just that you have a, 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 a gadget that tells you that some objects in the category will be what you want, and any object will, be a, will have a resolution by such things. That's the idea. So, um, now I'm going to give you a kind of inductive construction of a higher version of this. So, assume you, 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 you have been able to construct it an nth version of this guy. I will construct the nth plus one. So, core n plus one of x is going to be the infinity n plus one category. Just of stacks from y to x. And now I have to give to give you the morphisms, right? And the morphisms should themselves form an infinity n category, because if I if you want something which have, uh, let's say, which is an n category, the way to present it is to say, okay, let me take an ordinary category such that morphisms themselves are an n minus one category, and the homes here from y1 over x to y2 over x, they will just be uh, the category of correspondences in the fiber product of y1 and y2 over x. And this little h here is just to tell you that I'm taking homotopy fiber product. So when you take the fiber product, you first have to resolve one of those two guys. Uh, just like when you derive functor in, a, in, in, a, in homological algebra, when you take derived tensor product, you first have to take a, a resolution of one guy before taking the tensor product. It's just the same thing. Okay, so it, it defines uh, uh, a nice category. And the claim is that uh, for n of, let's say, the point, uh, so uh, sorry, all objects in core n of the point are what is called fully dualizable. And I'm not going to explain this because, I mean, it will be uh, quite complicated, but what I can tell you is a consequence of this. So the consequence is that it will produce just for free thanks to a result of Fleury, uh, a fully extended TFT. Um, so there exists a functor, uh, so a symmetric monoidal infinity n functor from something that I will just describe now to core n of the point that sends uh, the point here to y where y can be any object in core n. So any objects of this kind of nice category of higher correspondences gives rise to a TFT so, uh, what is this Borisum category? So, loosely speaking, 
object will be just a bunch of points. Morphisms between them will be just bordism between those things. Two morphisms will be bordism between one-dimensional strings. Three, uh, three morphisms will be bordism between two-dimensional guys, and so on and so forth, up to uh, stage n, where n morphisms will actually be just n-dimensional guys. And after that, n plus one morphism will be just DFO morphisms, so they will be invertible in particular, and n plus two will be homotopies between those guys and so on. So you can just think about it, you can truncate at stage n and say that it's just a category of cobordism, of bordism uh, up to stage n. And what really proved is that this FR here is for framed, so when you consider frame bordism, namely when all your manifold actually have a trivialization of the tangent bundle, this category is the just the free symmetric monoidal infinity n category with only one fully dualizable object. Which means that to define a TFT, a frame TFT, you just have to specify the image of the point, and that's all. So once you, you found a fully dualizable object in a nice higher category, it just gives you for free uh, um, a TFT, you know, a fully extended TFT. That's, I mean, that's a really a beautiful result. Okay. Um, yeah. So how explicit is the, this functor? That's the, that's the problem. So if you read the paper of Fleury, it, it, it uses a lot of technology. It's very difficult to make it explicit. So that, that's actually the point I was uh, about to make now, is that all this mapping space construction in this very specific case for this category gives you an explicit construction of this functor, and it's just the mapping space. So. Here, we have an explicit, well, I would say formula. So the functor of some d-dimensional guy sigma with d between 0 and n is just this mapping space from sigma b uh, to y. That's all. Um, and you can see from this that it's an actually an oriented theory. In, the, in, the, in this specific case, actually, uh, it only depends not on the framing, but it only depends on the orientation. OK, all right, let me give you again examples. So. Uh, if we take just the bordism between two points given by a line, uh, this will go to the following correspondence. So we take mapping space from the line uh, uh, to y. I mean, the line is contractible, so it's weakly equivalent to a point, so it's just y. And it is going to uh, map uh, To the mapping space of two point to y, namely uh, y cross y. So in this case, this borism between two point given by a line is just the diagonal map. Okay. Uh, another example: if if you take the disk, so the mapping space again, the mapping space from the disk to anything, so the disk is contractible, so it will be again y and it will map to the mapping space from S1, the boundary of this, to, to Y, so it will be the derived loop space of Y, and this map is just the inclusion of constant loops. Uh, and there's one last example, which is completely trivial, uh, is if you take the empty guy, Okay, the empty guy is just R map from the empty guy to Y. So this is just a single point. 
Okay. So this guy is the unit of uh, the Borisian category for for it for the disjoint union, and and the point is the unit for for the monoidal structure on on correspondences, which is just the um, Cartesian product. So that's that's okay. Okay. So now. What we would like to do is we would like to quantize this. I mean, this is definitely not discrete enough, and this is also not linear enough. By quantizing, you, we would like uh, some the same kind of things, but with values I don't know in a category of vector spaces or chain complexes, but something which is more linear. And uh, if we want to quantize, I mean. I was told when I was a child that we first have to, to look for a symplectic or Poisson structure. So, uh, so first, put uh, some kind of semi-classical data in this. So, the main idea will be to replace this category of correspondences by a category of Lagrangian correspondences. So I told you what a derived symplectic structure is and I didn't tell you what a, a Lagrangian uh, structure is in this context, so I'm going to do it now. So in the end it's exactly what you're used to, uh, to see, but it will just be expressed in a kind of fancy way. <laughs> Um, so, uh, definition, which is due to Panta F2 and Vaki and Vedozi. <coughs> so, if X is n symplectic, um, and we have a map from Y to X, an isotropic structure on the map F, or sometimes I just say Y, is uh, a path from zero to the symplectic structure in omega two closed. So omega two closed is, is, is actually a, a simplicial set. And by a path, I don't mean uh, the kind of path you could imagine just take, just putting, I mean, t in front of omega x and going very easily to zero. I don't mean this. I mean, you have a simplicial set. This lives in simplicial degree zero. Zero also lives in simplicial degree zero. A path is just something in simplicial degree one, which has source map going to zero and target map going to omega x. Sorry? Ah, sorry, f. Ah. The pullback of omega. Uh, thank you very much. So it's uh, so you pull back omega x on uh, on y, and you want this to be homotopic to zero, right? So if you just remove the word homotopic and replace it by equal, that's exactly the definition you know about an, something being isotropic submanifold. If f would be something like uh, an injective. Uh, okay, so now I have to tell you what Lagrangian is. <coughs> so Lagrangian just is just some non-degeneracy condition. Uh So it is Lagrangian if the map from Ty to Ty0 is a quasi-isomorphism. And let me just define for you Ty0. So it's just the, you, you could say just the, the space, uh, the orthogonal subs subspace uh, for, uh, for the symplectic structure, but I'm not very satisfied with this because it's not very well, uh, just it's not enough homotopy invariant, so I will write it in a kind of fancy way. So you have F star of Tx, which goes uh, to the cotangent space of Y with a shift. It's just the, the, the pairing with the symplectic, the pullback of the symplectic form. You have a map which is just a zero map, 
and we are looking at element in here on which the symplectic form vanishes. So I'm just writing uh, a Cartesian square and asking, I'm just defining ty0 to be the pullback of that. So the fiber product of 0 with this guy over uh, the shifted cotangent space on y. And this just topologically has a map to ty and we have a kind of natural transformation here, a homotopy. So we just ask that, so whenever we have an isotropic structure, we have such a map here. I mean, in the usual way, just say that an isotropic structure tells you that uh, Ty sits in inside its symplectic orthogonal. And I'm just asking that uh, this map is an isomorphism, but in the homotopy world, it would be just a quasi-isomorphism. So it's just the standard definition of a, a Lagrangian structure, just expressed in a fancy way. Uh, okay. So uh, one very important example. So obviously, honest isotropic and Lagrangian structure give you example of such a thing, uh, of such things. One very specific and very nice example is that if X is n-symplectic. Then the map from X to the point considered with its canonical n plus 1 symplectic structure is Lagrangian. So if you take the point, you can put the zero symplectic structure on it, but the zero symplectic structure can be seen as having degree n and plus n, whatever you want. I mean, it's just zero, it sits in every. Uh, uh, homological component of, of your complex of closed two forms. And being n-symplectic is just exactly the same as being Lagrangian, as, as being such that the map to the point is Lagrangian. Just check the definition, it's, uh, I mean, it's just a, a bunch of lines. Okay, so now a very important claim, which actually was uh, I mean, I think David uh, in his talk uh, talked about it. I, I, he said it very quickly. Uh, so let sigma be a compact PL manifold with boundary d sigma. Uh, then the restriction map from the mapping space from sigma to x to the mapping space from the boundary of sigma to x is Lagrangian. Think about the case when x is uh, the classifying space of a reductive group. So those two spaces are just space of uh, uh, local systems uh, on sigma and on d sigma. And what David said quickly is that if you have a three manifold bordered by, by a two manifold, uh, if you take local system on the three manifold, you have a restriction map to local system on the boundary. And, and he said it's formally Lagrangian because, I mean, you, you might have some problems with, uh, with uh, things not being smooth, but all this derived geometry stuff is just to tell you, okay, you can kick those question of smoothness, smoothness away. All this theory just do everything for you somehow. Okay, um, right. So let me give you some examples easier than this one. Okay. Um, so let me go back to my example, mapping space from this borism to x. So this is just x. And we have uh, this map, uh, the diagonal map, to the mapping space from two points to x. And here one has to be careful about the orientation, actually. This is just x cross x, but with the opposite symplectic structure. And we know that the diagonal map is, uh, is, is Lagrangian. I mean, the diagonal is Lagrangian inside x cross x up. Um, yeah, the other example is um, so 
So if you have uh, R map from sigma to x, and you assume that the boundary of sigma is just uh, empty, so the restriction map to the boundary just will go to a point, and this tells you that this guy is Lagrangian over that one. Well, if sigma is dimension d, d sigma will be dimension d minus 1, so this will be the guy with the appropriate shift. And this guy being Lagrangian does just mean that the, the, the guy on the left is n minus d symplectic. So you recover, I mean, the fact that mapping spaces are symplectic. Okay. Uh, I must say that this, this thing uh, that David also explained that uh, when you restrict to the boundary, you get something Lagrangian. It's the starting point of the construction of the Casson invariant. So if you have th a three manifold, uh, uh, you can always just, I mean, work a bit to, 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 to have what is called a Heger, Heger splitting. And then you have two pieces, which glue, I mean, two three manifold with boundary, which glue along the boundary. And there's a way to compute a very nice invariant of three manifold that way. And it, it, it uses the, all, all those uh, symplectic structures. OK. Let's move to Lagrangian correspondences. So, the, so that we we'll really have classical field theory. OK. How much time do I have still? Ten minutes. Wow. Okay. Um, okay. So I'll just play the same game as before with uh, the category of correspondences. So now x will be just n symplectic. So I'll define lag zero of x will be just uh, the infinity zero category of guys with a map to x which are Lagrangian. And iteratively, I'll define lag k plus 1 of x. Just So this will be just an infinity 0 category. The same guy, so same objects, and now morphisms. So from y1 to y2 will be just uh, Lagrangians k inside, again, yy plus 1, 2 over x, and I have to tell you that this guy is known to be n minus 1 symplectic. This is something I will explain just uh, in, a, in a few minutes, why this guy is symplectic, because we can view it as a, as a mapping space. <coughs> so again, uh, uh, I will be very quick. Uh, one can prove that uh, all objects are fully dualizable in those higher categories, so that we have, again, by the proof of the coborism of by Jacoburi, that we have a, a functor from board n to lag n, let's say of the point with any of its symplectic structure. And I must say that the most interesting situation is when k equals n. Why is it the most interesting situation? Because we, it's exactly when you recover the BV formalism. So what will be a Lagrangian over the point with an n-shifted symplectic structure? It will be an n minus 1 symplectic uh, stack. And so the point here will be sent to an n minus 1 guy. A line will be sent to an n minus 2 guy, and you go up to dimension n, you will have a somebody with a minus 1 symplectic structure. And this minus 1 symplectic structure, if you dualize it and take the, the, post, the, the associated Poisson bracket, is a degree 1 Poisson bracket. And this is really the starting point of the classical BV formalism, so the, this classical master equation. So this is why, I mean, it's very important to have those two guys being the same uh, here. And let me give you an example. Um, change Simon's theory is just th this with n equal 3. Oh, that was exactly here. Okay. Uh, so 
So when you take n equals k equal 3, x equal vg, this is classical of John Simons. Uh, there is another very interesting situation. It's still n equals 3, with k equals 1. You take x being a holomorphic symplectic, or an algebraic symplectic variety. And uh, this is what is called Rosensky Witten theory. Sorry? Can you summarize one for what K stands for? I, I didn't, I can't. What K stands for? Can you remind me? Ah, the, the, this was the K here, sorry. So in this case, there is, I mean, uh, the BV formalism does not hold. Okay. Um, okay, maybe it's time to discuss boundary conditions. So I will be quite quick. I mean, I don't, I don't have so much time. So five minutes left. Okay. Um, okay. So in, in the in this very long paper of Lurie, he also explained how to, uh, I mean, generalize those fully extendable theory to various kind of things. And then one situation is the presence of boundary conditions. And let me explain the the, the idea. So the idea, if you have a boundary condition, is that the not only you will have, I mean, boredism between things, so you will have a first kind of boundary just because you are, you are con considering boredism category, but you will have a second kind of boundary because your boredism themselves will have boundary. So the typical kind of things is that you will have this, that I will consider as a boredism, this strip is a boredism between two intervals which are themselves manifold with boundary, right? So you have two kinds of boundary. This, this boundary is just because it's an object and also everybody can have boundary, I, I, including the, the object themselves. So one should not mix the two and many people actually do it. Um, so what happened here is that you should at least in, include one new bodism, which is the bodism between the empty guy and the point, which is given by the following bodism with boundary, which is this segment. So I, I just want to distinguish this as being a boundary which is just uh, an object, so it's something which looks like this, and this boundary here has the same nature as the boundaries there. Okay? So, this guy is just a, a borism between the empty open subs the empty set and, and the points. And at least if you want a, I mean a fully extendable theory with boundary, you have to include that guy. And there is a theorem of freely that says you only have to include that guy and all the machinery works. So what it tells you is that you have to choose an object in your category, which, we, which is fully dualizable, but you also have to choose a morphism from the unit of your category to this object. And that will, give, that will produce for you uh, um, a TFT with boundary. So in our case, what will be such a morphism? So the unit of our Lagrangian correspondence category is just the point. So a morphism will be just uh, some guy L, which go to the point cross X. It's a it, it should be a Lagrangian correspondence, so actually it's X up. So it's basically more or less a Lagrangian in X. So boundary conditions in those classical theories are just Lagrangians. Um, and here again, I don't have time to explain it, but there is a way to write mapping spaces with boundary condition. You, I mean, you have to work a bit, it's, uh, uh, but, but it's possible. So there's also an explicit presentation of the functor by using mapping spaces. Uh, right. So uh, I want to say two more things. Uh, Okay, one is why 
this is n minus 1 symplectic here. So the reason it's n minus 1 symplectic is that if you have two Lagrangian guys uh, on x, you just look at the mapping space from the interval to x, but with specific boundary condition asking that the first point is sent to L1 and the second point to L2. And this is just by definition, it's the homotopy fiber product of L1 and L2 over x. And this guy being a mapping space from something which have relative dim dimension 1 and being compact to x, when you integrate over this interval with those boundary conditions, you have a, a symplectic structure which is shifted bound down by 1. So this, this kind of uh, relative uh, mapping space explains you why on the, rising, uh, on the rising intersection of Lagrangian manifold you have a symplectic structure shifted down by 1. And maybe one last comment is that uh, this allows one to recover uh, a kind of avatar of this uh, symplectic groupoid uh, at least the, the formal one of Katanem and Felder so let me try to explain this briefly um, okay so let's start with uh, x some Poisson variety um, so we can consider uh, the shifted cotangent uh, uh, space of x on which we put a differential which is basically the bracket with the Poisson structure. So, function, so I will call this M. Functions on M are just polyvector fields. So they are equipped... Uh, so this is obviously minus one symplectic. Or, no, probably one symplectic, sorry. And it has a differential, so it gives rise... I mean, it gives rise to a, to a, to a, to a stack. Ah, yes, thank you with a symplectic structure and moreover it has a Lagrangian uh, guy inside it which is X actually you could take any quasitropics and manifold take the cotangent uh, uh, the, the conormal bundle and it will give you a, an example of a Lagrangian guy inside it and now it, it, it produces for you a two-dimensional uh, because I mean if you look at, uh, at the, the appropriate degrees it produces for you a two-dimensional uh, field theory with values in this category of Lagrangian correspondences together with boundary condition prescribed by X. And if you look at the image of that string here, let me just call it G. So G will have two restriction maps to the two boundary pieces. So it will have two maps to X, which I will call source and target. And then you will have an operation corresponding to this borism with boundary uh, which gives a Lagrangian correspondences so it gives a Lagrangian between G cross G over S and T cross this guy we should treat those two and this one uh, separately also with a, a source and target here and this Lagrangian correspondence gives you the multiplication the, the multiplication of your groupoid so it, it kind of gives you back the, this uh, Katana-Felder uh, symplectic groupoid and I must say that it, it's probably a very formal object not very uh, nicely behaved and all this comes from the fact that from the beginning I did something which might seem quite quite stupid that here I started in my categories of correspondences by just killing all non-invertible isomorphisms. Uh, so you can repeat all this story by starting with a 1 here, by remembering also the non-invertible guy here, but then it appears that the, the, the objects in those categories are no longer all fully dualizable. And I, I think there's a kind of god guess that uh, being fully dualizable in this category my, I, I don't know, that's just a guess. Might be just exactly the condition that Kynik and Fernandez have for the integrability of, of Poisson manifolds. So I think I, I will just stop here now. Thank you very much.